All right, so we had just finished talking about glycolysis in the previous lecture, <clears throat> and so we were moving uh, in our in our topic of aerobic cellular respiration or cell processes. Uh, we were talking about um, the citric acid cycle happening next. So we talked about glycolysis. Remember glycolysis, uh, we took glucose. We had our energy investment stage where we had to put in uh, two ATP, and then we got our two G3Ps, and then we had our energy harvesting stage. In our energy harvesting stage, remember we got four ATP and two NADHs, and then we ended up with our two pyruvate <coughs> at the end. Um, then that gave us a net, you know, because we had the 2 ATP and we got 4 ATP out of it. We ended up with a net of 2 ATP, our 2 NADH, and then now we have 2 pyruvate at the end. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move these 2 pyruvate into the next steps of the process. So first, we're going to move this pyruvate. We're actually going to um, utilize an enzyme called uh, coenzyme A. And coenzyme A, what it's going to do is it's going to convert these two pyruvate into two molecules of acetyl-CoA. Uh, this is considered an intermediate step here. So this up here, remember we were talking about, uh, was glycolysis. And then down here, what we're going to talk about is the TCA cycle or citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. I can write all those out. Citric acid cycle, uh, Krebs cycle, or the TCA cycle. Any of those are describing the same thing. <clears throat> uh, but first we have this intermediate step um, where we convert our pyruvate into our acetyl-CoA. Uh, this takes coenzyme A, and then uh, we actually end up with a CO2 in this process. But one of the things that happens as well in this is that it actually we utilize an NADH two NADH pluses, and we're going to get two NADHs from it. Um, so when we're talking about two pyruvate, we're going to use two uh, coenzyme A's. We get two carbon dioxides out of it. We, get, we use two NAD pluses to get two NADHs. So we actually get a small little burst of energy in this intermediate step, two of them. And now we have acetyl-CoA. <coughs> So I'm just going to stop writing two in front of them, and we're going to do the math at the end. Uh, so when we're talking about the citric acid cycle now, uh, let's kind of move down here. We can start with our acetyl-CoA, and our acetyl-CoA now is going to move into the mitochondria. So remember, our glycolysis all happened in, oops, in the cytosol of the cell, so in the gooey jelly matrix area. And then now when we're talking about the uh, TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle, we're talking about the mitochondria. Now if we think about the mitochondria, remember the mitochondria was a double-membraned um, organelle. And so we had this uh, folded membrane. And it looks something like this. So this is our outer membrane of the mitochondria. This is the inner membrane of the mitochondria. This area inside of here, this is called the mitochondrial matrix. Uh, so, mitochondrial, just because it's based in, on the mitochondria, we're talking about the mitochondria, and the matrix. So this is the mitochondrial matrix. <clears throat> and the mitochondrial matrix is where our citric acid cycle or TCA cycle is going to happen. Uh, so this is where we're actually going to break down pyruvate into carbon dioxide. So we break down pyruvate into carbon dioxide, and then what we're going to gain from it is energy. And we gain energy in the form of ATPs, um, so we have some bursts where we're going to get ATP out of it, but we're also going to get little bursts of energy in the form of NADHs, which we've talked about briefly. They're electron transport carriers. But we also have a new one that we're adding, which is FA. DH2. So the NADH and the FADH2s are both electron carriers. <clears throat>
And so the FADH2, just like the NADH, are little tiny bursts of energy. So it holds a little bit of energy in the way of those electrons, uh, not as much energy as the ATP. So if we take a look at this, we have taken our pyruvate, we've converted it into acetyl-CoA, the acetyl-CoA is going to go through both of these membranes, so the outer membrane, the inner membrane, it's going to get into the mitochondrial matrix. And this is where we're going to have the TCA cycle occur. Mm -hmm. Then, jumping a little bit ahead, and we'll take a look at it again, but jumping a little bit ahead, the electron transport chain is actually going to occur on this membrane here. Uh, it's actually a series of embedded proteins in the membrane, so the ETC is going to happen here. This is our TCA in here. So the mitochondrial matrix and then these things that we're talking about are all going to be going to the electron transport chain, which is just within this membrane here. All right, so let's go ahead and move down here. We're going to take a closer look at the TCA cycle. <clears throat> so we have our pyruvate. And remember, we have two pyruvate, but we're going to take a look at that at the end. We've already said, or we've already noted, that we take our pyruvate and we turn it into acetyl-CoA. We use our coenzyme A to do that, and we get our CO2 in the process. We also utilize an NAD+, and convert that into our NADH. So we're getting CO2 from this process, and we're getting an NADH from the process. Now our acetyl-CoA is going to go into the TCA cycle. And this is a cycle, so we're going to kind of go in a circle here. The first thing we turn it into is called citrate. Uh, so again, when we're utilizing these arrows, we're talking about different enzymes. So an enzyme is going to come along, it's going to get rid of this CoA part, and we actually end up with what's called citrate. Now, we're not going to talk about all of the different things uh, that this molecule turns into, but we're going to go around in this direction and just keep in mind that this is a series of reactions here. We have lots of reactions that are occurring with lots of different enzymes um, and turning it into lots of different uh, molecules here. Mm -hmm. Now, in this process, I kind of randomly put these arrows uh, going around here, but I am going to see what comes off of the process here. So, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put in over here at the beginning part of the process, we're going to put an NAD plus in there. And then, of course, it's going to grab onto some electrons. It's going to give us an NADH. A little bit further down here, we're going to put another NAD plus into the process. And we're going to get out another NADH. Then down here, bottom part, we actually put in an ADP, which gives us an ATP. So we get one really big burst of energy here. <laughs> then as we continue on, we actually are going to put in the new one that we just talked about, which is where we're going to take an FAD going into the system. And what we're going to get out from that is an FADH2. Again, it's similar to our NADH, where it's going to hold on to electrons for us. And we see another one of those, NAD+, plus, getting us another NADH here. And then that brings us to our oxaloacetate, which then is going to go on to become citrate. Now it's going to go, it's going to combine with our acetyl-CoA in this process through an enzyme. It's going to drop the CoA and become citrate. And then it continues to go around the circle. So we keep feeding it pyruvate, which turns into acetyl-CoA. Then that acetyl-CoA is going to combine with our oxaloacetate uh, through the steps here. Then it's going to turn into citrate, which then is going to go into the cycle. So if we look here, we have a small burst of energy, NADH, that we get from the beginning here. We get another NADH here. We get a big burst of ATP here. We get an FADH2 little burst here and an NADH little burst here. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the process here, what we've done is we've taken one pyruvate and what we get out of it are three CO2. Uh, which I mentioned at the beginning here, I mentioned a CO2 here. I didn't mention the CO2 in the rest of the circle, but we do get some CO2 from the process here. 
Uh, so we got a CO2 up at the top here. We get two more here. Uh, so we get three CO2 plus, if we count up our NADHs, right, we have one, two, uh, three down here, but we need to count the NADH that we got up here when we converted into acetyl-CoA. So we actually end up with four NADHs plus one FADH2, all right, so we saw that new one here, FADH2, plus we got one ATP down here. So when we put one single pyruvate into the TCA cycle, or the citric acid cycle, what we end up getting are three CO2, four NADH, one FADH2, and one ATP. Now, if we think about this, right, we're talking about our starting um, molecule as being glucose, right? So we started with glucose, and we're going through this whole process of aerobic cellular respiration. Uh, so we went through the process of glycolysis, and we actually, at the end of it, ended up getting 2-pyruvate. Uh, so if we're talking about 2-pyruvate, then we need to do the math on that to find out what we're actually getting in the process. So when we're talking about 2-pyruvate, then, what we end up getting are 6, six carbon dioxide, 8 NADHs, Oops, not a comma, but a plus. Two FADH2s and two ATPs. So this is what we get from our kind of second chunk of aerobic cellular respiration. Um, if we add our glycolysis, right, so this is what we get from the TCA. I'm going to shorten it here because I'm out of space in the edge, but what we get from the TCA cycle is this. Now, if we add glycolysis to that, just to see where we're at as far as um, things that we're getting out of this process. Remember, we had one glucose, and out of that one glucose, we got uh, six carbon dioxide. So, so far, we're looking at six carbon dioxide. Plus, if we think about our uh, glycolysis, we got some NADH from that. Remember, we got two NADH. So if we add the two NADH from glycolysis to the eight that we just got here from the TCA cycle, then we're at 10 NADH plus two FADH2s, because we didn't get any of those from glycolysis. And how many ATPs did we get from glycolysis? And we got two ATPs from glycolysis because we're talking about net ATP. So total, now we're at four ATP. Two here from the TCA, two from glycolysis gives us four. So if we started with glucose, and now here we are at the end of the citric acid cycle, what we end up with are six carbon dioxide, 10 NADH, two FADH2s, and four ATP. So that's what we end up getting at the end of this so far. Uh, we haven't gone into the electron transport chain, of course. So let's just take a look at these really quick. Uh, so carbon dioxide, right? we see this, this is a waste product. This is, of course, what we breathe out, right? We remove it via the circulatory system. Um, and then, of course, the respiratory system. So removed via blood and then breathing. So it goes into the bloodstream, our carbon dioxide uh, goes from our cells into the bloodstream and we transport that carbon dioxide all the way up to the lungs and then that's what we breathe out is the carbon dioxide. And then of course we breathe in oxygen, which we'll use in just a moment. Um, ATP, this is the energy and this is what we want out of the whole thing. Uh, so that's good. But now we have the NADH and the FADH2s. So we have electrons that are attached to this NADH and these FADH2s. <coughs> So what happens uh, with these NADHs and these FADH2s? Well, these things are what are going to go to our electron transport chain. Uh, so the ATP, we're going to utilize as ATP, right? That's what we wanted out of this process, so we're going to take that ATP and use it to do whatever we need to do. Carbon dioxide is waste. We're going to get rid of that waste. But now, here we are in the mitochondrial matrix, so that inner section of that inner membrane, and we have these NADHs and FADH2s. Now, those are going to go to the electron transport chain. Uh, 
and the electron transport chain is going to happen at that inner membrane of the mitochondria. So let's take a look at the electron transport chain. So the electron transport chain. So this is, again, this happens at the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So again, if we, I kind of, we'll do a small one here, but we had our mitochondria and we talked about the TCA cycle happening within this matrix here, within the inner membrane. And then our NADHs and FADH2s are then going to go to our electron transport chain, which are going to be on this inner membrane. Uh, the outer membrane, of course, is just encapsulating this whole space here. So this is going to use the energy that is saved in those electrons, or from the saved electrons, and it's going to power the synthesis of ATP. Uh, so it uses energy from the saved electrons to power the synthesis of ATP. So again, remember we talked about the NADHs and the FADH2s as being little tiny bursts of energy. So little tiny bursts of energy, meaning these electrons provide energy. And what we're going to see is that um, we are going to see that that energy can be transferred and then kind of put together into making ATP. And we're going to see how that works. And that actually happens in about three different parts. So first, we have the electron transport. And so what this means, uh, this first step of the electron transport chain, is we're going to, have, going to have the electrons are going to be removed from the NADHs and the FADH2s. So we're going to take the electrons from them. And then what happens is those electrons are going to be transferred through a series of protein complexes. So transferred through a series of protein complexes. And so these are proteins that are embedded in the plasma membrane. So I'm going to do a quick drawing of that, um, and then I'm going to start talking again. All right, so I have drawn here. Uh, our mitochondria. So down here, this is our mitochondrial matrix. Remember the space in the inner membrane. Uh, this what I've drawn here, this is the inner membrane, and I've drawn various proteins. So these kind of globs in here uh, are the different proteins. Then we have the intermembrane space, so the space that's between the two membranes. So the inner membrane here, and then the outer membrane, which I have just drawn as a series of kind of scribbles here, rather than drawing out all the phospholipids and proteins and things like that. And we're not focused on the outer membrane so much. Remember, that just encapsulates all of this stuff. <clears throat> also notice that I've drawn a lot of hydrogen ions here. Uh, and, and if you notice the difference, there are more hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space than there are in the mitochondrial matrix. And that's an important concept that we're going to look at next. Uh, so remember, we're talking about the three different parts of the electron transport chain. Uh, the first part is the electron transport, meaning we're going to take those NADHs and FADH2s and we're going to transfer those electrons through these series of protein complexes. These are the protein complexes I've drawn in the inner matrix here. And then each transfer is going to release a little bit of energy. So I'm going to take our colors here. So we're going to take our NADHs, and our NADH is then going to transfer electrons to this first protein. And so it's going to transfer those electrons. When it does, we lose this hydrogen, and then we actually force that hydrogen out here into this intermembrane space. And then the NADH is no longer NADH, it's now NAD plus. Or I used to draw that in blue, so NAD plus is what we have now. 
Uh, so that hydrogen, we've, we've transferred electrons, really. So I think I'll use the electrons as red. So we've transferred electrons to this protein. And as we have transferred those electrons, what's actually happening is that these hydrogens are being kind of pumped across the membrane using that little tiny burst of energy. So kind of like the act of transport where we utilize ATP to force things against their concentration gradient. So areas of lower concentration, which would be like in here, to areas of higher concentration out here. So we've utilized this tiny burst of energy from the NADH, the little electrons we've given to this first protein complex. We've used that burst of energy to then force a hydrogen ion against its concentration gradient to the other side. So we have more hydrogen ions over in the intermembrane space now than in the mitochondrial matrix. So then these electrons are actually going to be transferred. So from the NADH, now they're in this protein complex. Then they get transferred to the next protein complex. Then they get transferred to the next protein complex. Once it gets transferred to that protein complex, the same thing happens. We force hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient into this intermembrane space. Uh, so we take hydrogens and move it over, utilizing that little burst of energy. And then we transfer the electrons to another protein complex. Then we transfer them to another protein complex here. Now when we do that, in this place, we are actually also going to take this hydrogen ion and force it against its concentration gradient to move it into the intermembrane space. But at the same time, remember oxygen is one of the requirements that we have for aerobic cellular respiration. So what happens is these electrons now have come down to this protein complex here. They're actually transferred to these, this oxygen molecule. This oxygen molecule grabs onto some hydrogens and now becomes water. So the electrons have then been transferred to the oxygen and then when they're transferred to the oxygen, remember the oxygen is pulling those electrons because the oxygen is electronegative. It's pulling the electrons toward it. That's why it's moving along these protein complexes. Once it gets to this oxygen, it pulls onto these positive hydrogens and then it makes water. So we end up making water in this process. Now what we've also done here is we've forced hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient into this intermembrane space. <laughs> And this is utilizing just one of these NADHs. Now remember, we have 10 NADHs that we're going to do this with. So 10 of them are going to go through this process, transferring electrons and moving hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient. Now we haven't even mentioned the FADH2s. So the FADH2s are going to do the same thing. They're going to move their hydrogen or their electrons, uh, transfer them right here though. So they're going to transfer them to this protein complex which then transfers them to this protein complex and then is going to move on in the same way, meet up with oxygen to make water. So our FADH2s actually don't get us as much hydrogens across this membrane uh, as our NADHs. So our NADHs are a little bit more uh, efficient because our FADHs actually skip this first protein complex here. But nonetheless, we drop off our FADH2s and our NADHs our electrons are transferred from protein to protein to protein until they end up at this oxygen, and then it combines with hydrogens in here and makes water. So this is actually what we would call step two. So I'm going to screw this up. Our step one was transferring the electrons. Our step two is our hydrogen ion gradient. So the energy that is released by the electrons is used to move hydrogen ions. <laughs> and so we are transporting hydrogens from the matrix, as we saw. So in this area here in the matrix, into the intermembrane space. And so this is active transport, right? We're utilizing the energy that's released by the NADHs and FADH2s to transport hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient or up their concentration gradient, up the concentration gradient, 
And so then what we're doing is we're creating this hydrogen ion gradient, meaning that we have a whole lot more hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space now than we do in the mitochondrial matrix. And what happens when we have lots of things on one side and not very many of those things on the other side? Well, they want to get back to the other side, right? Because we want to make everything equal. So these hydrogen ions now want to get back into the matrix. And in our third step, that's what we're going to see happen. So I'm going to kind of scoot this over here. I can zoom over here to talk about step three. So step three is ATP synthesis. In ATP synthesis, what we're going to see are the hydrogen ions are going to flow back into the matrix through what's called ATP synthase. So this is an enzyme, one that I have drawn right here, ATP synthase. This is the only enzyme slash protein uh, that you need to know in this process. So we, we already looked at this whole process here with all of these other protein complexes. You need to understand that the electrons are transferred to these protein complexes and they move protein complex to the next protein complex to get to the oxygen at the end. Uh, but you don't need to know the names or anything of them. You do, however, need to know ATP synthase. And that's part of this third step. So the ATP synthesis step requires ATP synthase. So what we're going to see, and I'll continue writing this out, but let's draw it out first, are these hydrogen ions. Remember, we have a lot over here in the intermembrane space. So these hydrogen ions are a lot higher concentration over here than they are down here in the mitochondrial membrane, or in the mitochondrial matrix. And as we said, they want to flow back into the matrix, and then they do that because they find this hole, this tunnel. This tunnel is going to allow them to go through and back into the mitochondrial matrix. <clears throat> and now what happens is as these hydrogen ions are trying to even things out, make sure that there are more or that there are the same amount of hydrogens on both sides of the membrane, the flow of hydrogen is going to provide energy to convert ADP to ATP. So our our flow of hydrogen ions <clears throat> provides energy to convert ADP to ATP. So if we, if we look at this, the way this is often thought of, this ATP synthase, the way it's seen, is that these hydrogen ions are going to flow down this tunnel. And then what happens is the shape of this is kind of like a water wheel. It's going to turn. So the hydrogen ion, so if we think of one hydrogen ion flowing through here, it turns this like a water wheel one time. When it does that, it's going to take an ADP that's floating around in here, and it's going to utilize that ADP and turn it into an ATP. ATP synthase, ACE, uh, is relating to an enzyme, ACE, and then synth is for synthesizing. So it synthesizes ATP. It's an enzyme that synthesizes ATP. Uh, so it's going to have ADP around it. The ADP around it is then going to get that last phosphate put onto it by ATP synthase, and that's done by this water wheel effect. So the hydrogen ion is going to go down this tube. It turns the ATP synthase molecule. And as it does that, it attaches a phosphate group to the ADP, turns it into ATP. And then the ATP goes on its way. And then we have the next hydrogen ion. is going to go down the concentration gradient as it would normally. It doesn't take energy. And then it turns this again and takes another ADP adds a phosphate group to make another ATP. And so all of these hydrogen ions, as they're flowing through ATP synthase, are going to be turning and turning and turning and turning. And when they do that, they're adding a phosphate group onto ADP, turning it into ATP. Uh, so it, oops, it's going to turn ATP synthase uh, like a water wheel. <clears throat> 
So then what we see is each NADH, so remember they dropped off three electrons, each NADH makes two to three ATP. Each FADH2 makes one to two ATP. So this is why we have up to 38 ATP, is because it's not an exact science, because it's relying on the hydrogens just flowing back down. And as they're flowing back down, we can say, well, the amount of energy when we dropped off NADH that forced the hydrogens up their concentration gradient or against their concentration gradient, when those hydrogens come back down, we can say it makes maybe 2 to 3 ATP. Uh, and FADH2, remember that got dropped off a little bit later in the protein complexes. So that got us a little bit less energy, makes about 1 to 2 ATP. So overall, then, remember what we're talking about. If we look at the overall uh, aerobic cellular respiration, we started out with our glucose, C6H12O6. We added oxygen. Remember where we added the oxygen? Right here in the electron transport chain. That's what's pulling the electrons toward it. That's forcing the hydrogen ions against their gradient. Then that's going to turn into six carbon dioxide. Remember, we got that carbon dioxide in the, in the uh, citric acid cycle, or the TCA cycle, or the Krebs cycle. That's where we got our carbon dioxide from the process. Plus six H2O. Remember, we got our water here, the electron transport chain. That's when we allowed the electrons to be pulled toward this oxygen we put in, which attached on to positive hydrogens, giving us water plus our ATP. And then again, this is up to 38 ATP. <clears throat> now the 38, again, is because we have 10 NADHs that we dropped off, two FADH2s that we dropped off. And if we look back here, remember our, our summary at this point, we had gotten four ATP total from glycolysis and the TCA, or the citric acid cycle. Uh, so if we go down here, we have four ATP from glycolysis and the TCA cycle, just what we need for that. So if we have 10 NADH and we say that we get three from each, that's about 30 ATP on the high end. If we have two FADH2s and we get two ATP, that's about four on the high end there. So total would be 38 ATP if we were looking at the absolute most we could get from our NADHs and FADH2s. And then, of course, we got these four ATP from glycolysis and TCA uh, very specifically or on our own. So this is how we get our, our grand total of up to 38 ATP. So before we move on to fermentation, I just want to summarize that we had talked about glycolysis. And then in glycolysis, we took glucose. On the first part of it, we had our energy investment phase. That's where we had to invest two ATP. When we did that, though, we broke our six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules, our two G3Ps, our glyceraldehyde three phosphates. Then we had our energy harvesting phase. In our energy harvesting phase, we get out energy, harvest four ATP and two NADHs. <clears throat> we also get from that two pyruvate. So our net total here would be two ATPs and two NADHs and our two pyruvate. Our two pyruvate then go into this intermediate step. Intermediate step, where we convert the pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. So both of them, two pyruvate into two acetyl-CoA. We get carbon dioxide in this process, but we also get NADHs. Then our acetyl-CoA goes into our mitochondrial matrix, the inner part there. What we get there is we break down this acetyl-CoA, goes into citrate, and then is going to go around the citric acid cycle. We get our grand total per pyruvate of three carbon dioxide, four NADH, one FADH2, and one ATP, which of course then we have to multiply by two. So six CO2, eight NADH, two FADH2, and two ATP. And when we add that to glycolysis, we get this here, our 6 carbon dioxide, 10 NADH, 2 FADH, 2, and 4 ATP at this point. Then we take those NADHs and FADH2s and put them into our electron transport chain. 
the first part of that is that we are going to be dropping off the electrons, so electron transport. Our NADHs drop them off at the very beginning here. Our FADH2 drop them off just a little bit into the process. As those electrons are transferred from protein complex to protein complex, that is going to cause our hydrogen ion gradient, the st second step, which is going to be moving hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient. When they're moved against their concentration gradient, we end up with a whole lot more hydrogens in the intermembrane space. That then makes the hydrogens want to move back to the matrix because they want to make things even. And so then they find this tunnel here at the end called ATP synthase. And that ATP synthase is going to make ATP. And that's because our hydrogen ions are going to move down this tube here, this ATP synthase tunnel. And as it does it, it's like a water wheel. The flow of hydrogens goes down and it turns this wheel. Every time it's turning this wheel, it's going to be adding a phosphate group back onto ADP, making ATP. So then at the end, we have our 10 NADHs and 2 FADH2s that we dropped off at the electron transport chain, which can get us up to our 34 ATP in the electron transport chain. We add that 34 ATP to the four that we got from glycolysis and the TCA cycle, giving us a grand total or maximum of 38 ATP from aerobic cellular respiration. So that summarizes um, all of aerobic cellular respiration. You need to know all of the things that we just discussed in all of these different steps. Now, I do want to briefly mention here um, at the end of our aerobic cellular respiration, that not all things, again, we talked about this at the beginning, go through aerobic cellular respiration. So again, aerobic implies or um, tells you that it has to do with oxygen. And we know that it has to do with oxygen because that's what's pulling the electrons toward it. So what happens if we don't have oxygen or what happens if we don't have mitochondria? So if we have no oxygen or no mitochondria. So if we don't have any oxygen, we can't pull the electrons toward the oxygen to make water and then have that hydrogen ion gradient happen. And if we don't have mitochondria, we don't have the TCA cycle. We also don't have the electron transport chain. We don't have any of those things occurring. We just have glycolysis happening at the beginning. So the cells can use glycolysis to produce two ATP and two NADHs. Because remember, glycolysis happened in the cytosol. And since it happened in the cytosol, you don't have to have a mitochondria in order for glycolysis to happen. But now we have two ATP, which is great, because if we want to make ATP, we can go through glycolysis and we can make two ATP. Even if we don't have any oxygen or we don't have a mitochondria, now we have two NADHs. What we need to do in order to use the NADHs, remember it's storing up little bits of energy, is we need to remove those electrons. So we need to remove the electrons from the NADHs to reuse it. So we reuse it by the NADH. If we drop off the electrons, then we go back to having NAD+. Plus. And then we can use that NAD+, plus, add electrons to it, and then it becomes NADH. Uh, so this is why it's our little transport. A lot of times people will talk about it. I like to refer to them as our taxi. So our NAD+, plus and our FADs are like little taxis. They go and they pick up electrons and then they drop them off. So our NAD+, plus goes and picks them up in glycolysis, picks up our electrons and drives them over to the electron transport chain and drops them off. So when they pick up the electrons, then they're called NADH. They drop off the electrons. Now they're back to being NAD+. Then they go back to glycolysis. They pick up more. They become NADH. Then they drop them off at the electron transport chain and become NAD+. Same thing with FAD. So FAD is another little taxi. FAD goes and picks up electrons, becomes FADH2. Then it drops them off at the electron transport chain, becomes FAD again. Now this course, FAD plus and FAD have nothing to do with glycolysis. I was just relating them to the NAD. Uh, we do have two NADH, though, that we can get from glycolysis. So now 
if we have no oxygen or no mitochondria, we can go through glycolysis, we end up with 2 ATP, which is great, but not as good as 38 ATP that we get from aerobic cellular respiration. Uh, we do have 2 NADH, though. So then what we can do is we can use a process called fermentation. And fermentation is going to pass the electron from NADH back to the pyruvate. So it's going to transfer the electrons from NADH to pyruvate. Uh, and so then it's not going to make as much ATP as cellular respiration, um, but it is very helpful. So um, there are two different types of fermentation. So there's one type of fermentation, which is called lactic acid fermentation. The other type of fermentation is ethanol fermentation. These are the two we're going to talk about briefly. So in our lactic acid fermentation, In lactic acid fermentation, this is what's going to happen in muscle cells uh, that run out of oxygen. So we talked about if we go running. Let's say you go for a long-distance run, uh, and you're running and running and running, and maybe not even long-distance. Let's say a short sprint. It doesn't matter. Either way, when you start to run, you've got lots of oxygen going through your bloodstream. You've been breathing. You've been sitting down at home, putting your shoes on, things like that. You're breathing normally, you're getting lots of oxygen into your cells, lots of oxygen in your bloodstream, but then you start to run. <clears throat> so then as you're running, your muscles are using that oxygen uh, to go through aerobic cellular respiration and make ATP so that the muscles can move. So you have all the contracting of the muscles as you're running. Uh, now this process of using the oxygen and making ATP is going to go faster than breathing in oxygen and your blood getting that oxygen all the way to your muscle cells, then that oxygen getting from your blood into your muscle cells to then go through the entire process to make ATP. Uh, so even though it does a really, really good job of that, it, our breathing can't keep up with getting the oxygen to our muscle cells, depending on the type of exercise you're doing. So in our muscle cells, once they start to run out of oxygen, even though you're breathing uh, more, uh, quicker, to try to get oxygen in your body even faster, uh, they will run out. And so what we do is we see we use glucose. Okay, we're going in the process utilizing glucose, uh, which is our C6H12O6. And then what we see is it's going to end up giving us 2 C3H6O3 plus 2 ATP. All right, so we end up there with our 2 ATP, and then we have our two molecules of pyruvate. Now, we go through glycolysis, okay, and at the end of glycolysis, right, we get our pyruvate. But then what we do is this, in glycolysis, remember we've used this NAD+, and we get NADH from glycolysis. This is why we're saying, what are we going to do with the NADH? In NADH, we're actually going, or using the NADH, we're going to attach it to the pyruvate, <laughs> which is then going to produce NAD plus for us. That NAD plus can then go back up to glycolysis and grab those electrons again and make more NADH. They can then drop off the electrons again. Now when that happens, pyruvate in this process here is going through fermentation, and then it's going to make what's called lactate. Lactate or lactic acid. So the process of the NADH dropping the electrons off to the pyruvate is the fermentation process. And then in that process, we end up getting lactate, also called lactic acid. And then this can start to build up in the cells, and the cells eventually have to break it down. We often see this as muscle soreness, is when we have this buildup of lactic acid in the muscles. Um, but it's pretty great because it's getting us ATP while we're waiting on that oxygen. As soon as we get more oxygen to the cells, our body will automatically switch over to going through aerobic cellular respiration. And then when it runs out of oxygen again, then it'll go through fermentation, lactic acid fermentation, and then it'll switch back over to aerobic cellular respiration as soon as it can. Because of course, in this process, even though we're able to transfer the electrons from the NADH to the pyruvate, 
we get lactic acid as a buildup, we still get the NAD+, which is great, because then we can grab onto those electrons again, <coughs> transfer them over, make lactic acid again, um, which keeps glycolysis going, having NAD pluses to be able to pick up the electrons. If we didn't have the NAD pluses to pick up the electrons, then glycolysis would stop. Um, of course, from glycolysis, we're only getting two ATP, but two ATP is better than no ATP when we're trying to run. Let's say we're trying to run from a bear, not just for fun. Uh, so we want to get as many ATP as we possibly can. So that's our lactic acid fermentation, which we see here in humans. <laughs> the second one was our ethanol fermentation. In ethanol fermentation, we see this in yeasts and some bacteria. <clears throat> now, this we're not going to go into as much detail, but in ethanol fermentation, what we're seeing is, is similarly, we're going to be taking the pyruvate, <laughs> and through a series of steps uh, that we don't really need to talk about, we actually end up making ethanol. Uh, so, in this case, uh, the organism can have sugar, right? It can eat sugar, yeast will feed yeast sugar, or glucose. Then what they end up making are two molecules of C2H5OH, ethanol, plus we get some carbon dioxide out of there, which is the gases from fermentation, and two ATP. Uh, so they get the two ATP here. Uh, so similarly, it's not as effective or as efficient as aerobic cellular respiration because uh, we're not getting 38 ATP, we're just getting 2 ATP. Uh, but in this case, we end up with ethanol, some carbon dioxide, which we see released as gas from these different yeasts and bacteria. And again, we fed them the same thing. We can feed them glucose. They get energy from it, uh, albeit a little bit less or a lot less uh, than the 38 from aerobic cellular respiration. But if you don't have any oxygen and you don't have any mitochondria, that's still great. Uh, and then they produce ethanol as a, a waste product and gas. Both of those are waste products. Uh, so we as humans uh, harness this fermentation, right? We, we utilize fermentation to make various things. So we use it in bread, for example. And that's why bread will rise is because of this gas that we see. Uh, so the gas that's released um, is the rising in the bread. And then, or the, yeah, the carbon dioxide. And we do that by using different um, yeasts, right? Yeast is added to bread. Um, also beer. Uh, other various alcohols <clears throat> that will be part of the ethanol and then the CO2 gas that's released. Uh, so beer and wine utilize fermentation. Also things like uh, sauerkraut and yogurt, uh, yogurt, uh, vinegar, uh, kombucha, different things like that. Um, <clears throat> and we utilize different yeasts and different bacteria. Uh, some of these are different bacteria over here. Uh, to go through these fermentation processes. And one of the great things about it is it can preserve food. So the acid, so like the lactic acid or uh, the alcohol, or and the alcohol, the ethanol, alcohol, uh, inhibit the growth of microorganisms. Uh, so it's helpful. We put little microorganisms in there, but we utilize those microorganisms, like the different yeasts and the bacteria that we add to these things. Uh, but we utilize them to go through fermentation, and then the lactic acid that they make as a result, or the ethanol that they make as a result, is going to make it so these things are fermented and preserved. So then other things will come along, and since they're in a high acid uh, situation, these other bacteria or other molds or, or yeast or things aren't going to be able to survive. Uh, so it's a great way to... Uh, preserve food for long term. Uh, so that's it for fermentation, just understanding that there are the two different types, lactic acid fermentation and ethanol fermentation, uh, that we see lactic acid fermentation in our muscle cells when we run out of oxygen, <clears throat> and then we have the ethanol fermentation that we see in different products like beer and wine and, and things like that, where we get ethanol as a byproduct, where they're making ATP for themselves, and then we have gas as a, as a, a byproduct as well. <clears throat>